right, everybody, welcome. This is Project Herpetoculture Podcast, episode 66. And I'm your host, Roy Arthur Blodgett, joined as always by the indescribably handsome Philip Leeds. Whoa. And we have an excellent guest today, a return guest to the show who I'm excited to chat with. But before we do that, we're going to go over our housekeeping. And first, I want to give a shout out to Dylan and the Animals at Home Network for hosting us. It's been another great year on this network, and we're really grateful for it. We go. Absolutely. And I also want to give a shout out to Mr. Vernal Pools himself, Charlie Davenport, for editing our audio and providing our fantastic theme music. Charles in charge. Absolutely. And I want to talk about our sponsors. So we have Custom Reptile Habitats, and they're makers of premium PVC reptile enclosures. Um, we have an affiliate link for them posted in our bio. So if you're interested in uh, purchasing an enclosure from them or some supplies like Universal Rocks products, and you use that link, we'll receive a small commission at no additional cost to you. And that always helps us out. We also have Cold-Blooded Caffeine, and they are roasters of premium coffees from all over the world. And they donate 5% of the proceeds from each bag of coffee sold to conservation in those equatorial coffee growing regions where you find some incredible herpetofauna. And we also have fairy tale dragons. So that's Heather Moy and Ron St. Pierre. They're producing some of the finest bearded dragons in the world alongside some other really cool obscure herpetofauna. So give them a follow. And if you're looking for bearded dragons, look no further than fairy tale. And I should say, can, you mind if I add something to that real quick? Please go for it. Yeah. I should also just say too, that like one of the things I really appreciate about Ron and Heather is how helpful they are. You know, yeah. like they, they, they talk to so many different people and they help out so many different people. And, and I'm no exception to that. Like I've been a, a, a beneficiary, beneficiary of their like <laughs> emotional and herpetocultural assistance in terms of making sure I'm not doing things terribly wrong. Or when I mess up, they're always there to help me feel better about it. I mean, they're, they're, they're amazing. So they deserve all the support we can give them. Absolutely. Yeah. And lastly, I'm very pleased to announce our newest sponsor, which is Tamura Designs. Um, so for those who don't know, Tamura Designs is one of the finest enclosure manufacturers out there. And they are really doing some awesome novel stuff within the herpetoculture space, producing incredible um, full system habitats that provide day and night cycling, um, photo period regulation, air circulation, they also produce these incredible condo setups here, which you can see. These are what I use to rear all of my herbs here, all the Spilotes babies that I have right now, all the Polikers I produce. They all go into those. And that allows me to provide a really high level of care. I can still provide all the UV and overhead heat that I want to for all my herbs at that same standard that I do with my adults for the youngsters. And he's also producing some really cool new stuff like these um, deli cup displays for expos. I'll have one of those showing off some Spilotes at the Pomona Super, so, uh, Super Show. So um, we're really stoked to have um, the support of Tamura Designs on the show. It's um, one of our favorite brands out there, and we're really grateful that they signed on to support. So if you're looking for anything from them, um, you can use the code HERPETOCULTURE for 15% off a one-time order from them. So check that out. And they don't do discount codes very often, so get on that if you want to try out some of the best stuff out there. Yeah. And uh, to just to piggyback off of that too, I mean, I've been paying attention to Tamora Designs for a long time. I mean, they have such beautiful, like Dale makes incredible stuff. And it's really, really nice to see individuals out there like really pushing the craft forward and like not just trying to bring like great work to people, but it doing it in a way that like looks phenomenal too. You know, just looks mm -hmm. so good and so clean. And so, um, like it really, like it motivates you to really want to like push your stuff to the next level. It's pretty cool. I can't wait to add some of that stuff to my, to my, my facility here. <clears throat> Absolutely, man. Yeah. So with all that, I said, the last thing, last little plug here is just for our Patreon. If you are interested in supporting the show directly with just like a tip or a small donation, we always welcome that. And we're at patreon.com slash project herpetoculture. We actually have a live chat. Um, scheduled for our Patreon subscribers that will, our first one will be actually later today. Um, but we'll be doing those on a monthly basis at least. So yeah, sign on over there if you'd like to join. And with all of that out of the way, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest today. And that is Chris Sharp of Chris Sh of Sharp Shooter Reptiles. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. No, you're Sharp, Sharp, you're Sharp Shooter Reptiles. And um, he's a man. I'm really glad that he's uh, joining us here again today. How are you, Chris? 
I'm doing well. How are you guys over there? Pretty good. Pretty in, good. In, your, in your perspective states, as it were. <laughs> oh, yeah. Killing it. Loving it out here in the damn Mile High City. <laughs> Man, I'm I'm pumped for the for the super show. Like I can't, like I I can't I I like I've never done one before. I've never been it. I've never like been to one of these damn events. Like I'm I'm just beyond stoked, and uh, I can't wait to meet some people and um, you know, hang out and do you know, hopefully do a little herping too. Like I I can't tell you how psyched I am. To yeah, get away. It, it should be really really good. Um. The, the super show is exhausting in the most positive way possible, if that makes sense. It so, does. Yeah, it's uh, lots of lots of foot traffic, meet a lot of people. You know, it's just it's a lot of fun. So, yeah, I can't it's going to be good. I've already had like a we'll number of people. No, stop it. No, no, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I've already had like a number of people reach out to me when I've made a post saying like, hey, I'm going to be there. I've already had a bunch of people reach out and be like, I'm going to be there. I'm going to come say hi. I'm like, sick. Cool. <laughs> Looking well, forward if, to it. If, you're, if you remember, Phil, I told you a couple months ago that people were going to be excited and want to come see you and you poo-pooed that. Oh, no, yeah. they won't. They don't care. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Well, I, still stand like, by my, I still stand by my statement. Well, you could be wrong. It's okay. <laughs> Listen, it, it, we'll see we, who's right. By all means, on January sixth and seventh. Let me see. Yeah, <laughs> let me tell you, it wouldn't be the first time that I've been wrong, nor will it be the last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. Uh, so, what's been going on, Chris? Like, since we last spoke to you, like, what's uh, other than uh, other than uh, you know one of two babies pictured? What uh, what <laughs> what, uh, what what's been going on in your world? So the yeah, as you mentioned, uh, my little twin boys are born in June. Congratulations! Um, yeah, thanks. Amazing. Uh, it went about as well as it could um, for the listeners that have kids out there. Um, they were gigantic for twins. Um, combined over fourteen pounds of baby in my wife, so that's pretty impressive. Ooh. Wow, um, baby! Yeah, so for twins, it was great. Um, and they actually took up a lot more of my time than I thought. I thought, oh yeah, I'll have. Uh, you know, some things will change, but things changed I mean, quite a bit for me um, in a good way. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, it's been a lot of fun with them. Uh, I haven't done as much herping or fishing as I normally would do uh, okay. throughout the year, just because, you know, I'm with the kids all the time. Um, and then when I'm not dealing with them and I'm not away for work, then it's, you know, blitz through the snake room and do as much as I can, as fast as I can, get it all done. And so time management, again, we talked about it last time I was on. I'm having to adjust yeah. my time management strategies a little bit so that you know, I can do everything the best that I can. So, yeah, that's kind of the, that's kind of the nitty and gritty of it. I've added a couple new little projects. Um, I grabbed some uh, Spilotes, Pilatus, Tiger Rat. So I've got a pair of those I'm working with. Uh, I've got a captive bred female and um, a wild caught male that uh, is doing really, really well. And what else? What else am I dealing with right now? That's probably the newest cool project I've got going on. The um, babies? That's the newest cool project? No, just well, <laughs> I mean, that'll be a lifetime project. But yeah, yeah. Um, I'll tell you what, when they're big enough to get in there and, you know, even just hold a snake while I'm cleaning an enclosure or, or can fill water bowls for me or whatever, I'm super excited about that. So yeah, yeah. hopefully they're as into it as I hope they will be. But, you know, we'll see. So for sure. And they're sure. steeped in it. They've already been to more reptile shows than I have. I mean, I'm pretty sure. Same. Yeah, they went it to their isn't, first isn't show. Saying much, but they were at their first show at five weeks old, uh, okay. which is pretty great. So, um, which I got, I talked to way more people walking around with twins in a stroller than I did standing behind a table, which is interesting. So, yeah, kind of, kind of seems that seems right. It seems on that tracks. Well, you know, I mean. There's definitely a shift in her pediculture where there's a lot more women involved, but it's still mm-hmm. heavily male dominated. Uh, and I don't say that in a bad way. Um, it's just mm-hmm. just a cultural shift. So the women that are there are mostly wives or mothers or girlfriends. Mm-hmm. So, when, you know, babies are exciting for them. I wait, get wait, it. Totally. They're yeah, exciting wait, wish, for me too. Wish, mm-hmm. wish were you saying, I'm not saying that in a bad way, that, that there's more women involved in her pediculture. Or that no, 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 no. Because it's, it's been primarily, it's been primarily a male dominated thing. You know? I'm <laughs> yeah. not saying it's a bad oh, thing. I'm not saying it's a good thing. It's just, it is what it is, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, oh, it's culture great. shift. I mean, that's, that's the way it is across, across the, the scope of, of most mm-hmm. things. 
I mean, yeah. my yeah. wife, my wife still works at a zoo, the zoo here in Fresno, you know, and zoological institutions were heavily, heavily male dominated up until probably only 10, 15 years ago. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and now there's a huge shift where it's um, equal, if not even more female dominated, especially at the keeper, keeper level. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Anyway. Right. Yep. No, that's, that's awesome. Interesting. That's great. Um, super cool. Well, t- uh, so tell us a little bit more about those, those projects, like, and what, what kind of drove you, um, drove you towards those new ones and like what you're psyched about. And yeah. Sarah. So it, it's kind of a, I don't know if I, if double-edged sword is the right word, but, um, yeah. with the, with the boys, I've kind of realized that I have to cut back my collection. Um, just because I, do, I don't have time to manage the animals the way I want to. Um, mm-hmm. Well, let me take it back. I do have time to manage them, but then I have time for nothing else. And I don't want it to only be work, work, work. You know, Mm -hmm. I want to have time to have fun with the kids and the family and everything. So I am shifting my collection a little bit. Um, You know, I've been rehoming, replacing, selling, however you want to look at it. Some of the the projects that are either, and it sounds really bad, but you know, that don't bring in as much money. So I've sold off a lot of my corn snakes, some of my king snake projects. Um, not that I'm getting rid of those. I, you know, mm-hmm. I struggle, I struggle not having less expensive animals because I like to be talking to people about their first pet reptile. But at the same time, mm-hmm. I have to make space and time and, you know, a, a blue barons or a tiger rat snake as a patchling mm-hmm. takes up about the same space as maybe a baby king snake and they all eat the same. So, yeah. you know, if a king snake's going to make me a hundred dollars or I'm going to get 400 or whatever for a tiger rat or a thousand for a mm-hmm. baron, it's like, well, you know, I, I don't do reptiles for money, but I do them at the, at the level I do them because of money. I would always have reptiles, even if it didn't make me money, but I'm not going to have hundreds of them if it's right. just a money pit. So, um, anyway, so that's where we are with that. But, you know, I like the South America stuff, obviously with the baron eye, um, mm-hmm. And, you know, the tiger rats uh, kind of fill some of a similar niche or niche, I guess, if I want to sound like you guys and educated. Um, Yeah, niche. Damn it. Um, They feel kind of the same, a similar niche as the uh, the bird snakes, the Frenanax postal notice that I've got. Mm -hmm. And so it just kind of made sense to keep some similar species. I've always liked the tiger rats, the higher color tiger rats. So I have the, uh, you know, the the Nicaraguan animals, Mm -hmm. which we all know are probably not from Nicaragua, but... uh, And I've been super picky about it. It's a species I've wanted for a while. And I just held out until I found some individuals that really, really looked nice to me, you know? Um, yeah. I'm trying to think about other projects. I got some box turtles, as odd as that sounds. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, one of the things I wanted to do was get some box turtles for the boys that were hatched this year so they could have a little pet that yeah. was born the same year they were because box turtles. Oh, wow. are so uh, whether or not Which- the boys keep them... Um, I got some Florida box turtles for them. Nice. And then uh, I was gifted a pair of Eastern box turtles at the same time. So that's pretty cool. And I haven't had box turtles in a long time, but uh, you know, as a kid, they were almost like, like Pokemon cards. People gave away box turtles all the time and they just lived in their backyards, yeah. but time mm-hmm. to change quite a bit, obviously. So um, yeah. other projects. Yeah. Um, you had some frills hatch. I, yeah. So a lot of people didn't even know I had the frills. Um, I guess I that, know. yeah. So, you know, I, I'm not really good at promoting myself, you know, so I, I have cool projects and a few of my close friends know what's going on, but I just don't ever really talk about a lot of things I've got. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I got super lucky. Um, I bought a group of five little baby Aussie frills that came in on the UK import through, uh, Ashley. She brought those into Canada and then to me, it ended up being 1.4, which is pretty incredible. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, I didn't even think they were big enough to breed or lay eggs or anything. And I saw a female, I was like, Oh, that looks like eggs. And so <laughs> I got her set up and she laid eggs. I think the next day she laid a little clutch of four eggs and she's not, they're not wow. big. I didn't think they were even big enough to breed, but I was able to hatch those out. Um, and they seem to be doing well. Um, and you know, along those lines, it's made me kind of rethink, like maybe I want more lizards than Hell yeah. snakes. So I'm not jumping on your mastics yet, Bill. Uh, just because yeah, you say that now, but well, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to say that until I can really, you know, if I can't do at least what you do, I'm not going to get a Euromastix. So 
What do you wait? Yeah. Wait, what does that mean? What do you mean? At least what I do? You mean like three hundred of them every? Like, no, <laughs> no, no, no. If I can't, if I in can't have like, a, and yeah, if I can't have like a kiddie pool for one, you know, yeah. right now I don't, I don't have the space for that. And I, you know, I think oh, that yeah. you, and I don't. This is not to sound negative at all because I think you're way beyond minimum. But for me, I think that you are, you know, the the minimum standard of care, which is still a high, highly elevated standard of care. What's that, that face for? I was just, I was like a forced smile. Well, yeah. So <laughs> I just, I feel like you've got it worked out. You know, you've got a really, really good system. Well, You're somewhat minimalist, which is kind of how I like to do my mm-hmm. stuff too, because it makes care really easy. You can go in, no nonsense kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. As much as I enjoy Roy's enclosures, um, it's too much work for me. <laughs> so it yeah. sounds, yeah, yeah, sounds yeah. kind of lazy. But uh, anyway, so when I, <laughs> when I can do something like that, then I'll get some euros. But um well, I haven't figured, I still haven't figured out that tail whirl problem. So I don't have anything dialed yet. You know, once I figure that out, then I'll feel okay about it. But, right. Uh, what, what was, so what, when you say, okay, when you say that you didn't think they were big enough to breed, how big were they? And then like, how big were you expecting them to be before you would have ex- anticipated they were big enough to breed? Right, 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 right. So uh, overall, my females, um, we're going to say goodbye to Riley. Bye. Bye, Bye Riley. Riley. Enjoy Thanks for joining us, buddy. Um, so the females are all about, um, I'd say they're right at close to the two foot mark, maybe total oh. length, but yeah. body size wise, I expected them to be much bulkier. Um, but I'm, I, you know, to be honest with you, I, I really don't know what a full grown adult female frill looks like. You know, yeah. I don't know that I've ever really seen one in person to to have that kind of scope or scale. So I just figured they were going to be right. They're pretty like yeah. lean and lanky. Long they body. are. Yeah. 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 Pretty lean. Um, I mean, like compared to like a bearded dragon, which is kind of what I was. I don't know. I guess I was envisioning thicker, maybe obviously not the pancake like a bearded dragon, but I just expected them to just be heavier bodied. So sure. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I just, you know, and even then, um, you know, I've talked with a lot of people. I talked with Jay Summers. I talked with uh, John from Sim Container. You know, guys that I knew that had worked with them said, hey, how do you sex these stupid things? Because mm-hmm. for the longest time, I couldn't. They're like, oh, you just got to yeah. look at the way the frill lays on the body. And like, well, it all looks the exact same to me. You know, mm-hmm. for a long time, I thought I actually had two males, and three yeah. females. Then I thought I had three males and two females. And then I finally realized, okay, when the one laid eggs, like, okay, well, if that's what that looks like, then I have four females. So, um, cause one of the ones I thought was a male is one that laid eggs. So <laughs> obviously, wow. uh, I, I didn't know what I was doing. The one, the male is very obviously a male. He's, he's big, you know, he's it over double the body size of the females heads twice the size of the females. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, just a, big just a rad lizard. So, so yeah. That's awesome. interesting how like it can be difficult to like, to figure out, yeah, like even just like sexing stuff like that, you know, where, where there's not like a clear, obvious guidebook or like, you know, method to it. I, I dealt with that with the polychrist, the marmoratus, when I first started keeping them. It took me forever to figure out like, how do you actually accurately sex these things? And now it's like I can look at a photo of one and immediately yeah. know what it is by very subtle differences in like the proportions of the body. Um, right. You know, but, but like it took forever to kind of get that kind of familiarity. And I was looking online, there's all, there's all kinds of stuff that people were saying like, Oh, like the females have this Brown dorsal stripe that the males don't have. And that's like totally not true. Like they both have the Brown dorsal stripe or they could, neither could have it. It depends, but there's all kinds of stuff like that out there. And it's like, Oh, it's actually just like, you know, you just got to figure it out yourself sometimes. Yeah. 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 Man, it's, it's really weird. There's, I've had a couple of weird experiences with some of the euros where like I'll be working with something that I think is like, you know, like a group of fully, fully formed adults. And I'm like, Oh yeah, this is like an adult, you know, whatever it is. And then I'll, I'll get a new adult from somebody or like <clears throat> this happened years ago, actually specifically with Yemenensis. I had like a, what I thought was an adult female Yemenensis and I got a male on breeding loan. This was way before I had uh, any, like any success in breeding that species. And I get this mail from this lady in Florida and he is an absolute monster. Like he's like three times her size, you know? And, and just like, he's bigger than he was bigger than most of my adult or not at the time too. And I was like, Whoa, wow. like I'm, I'm way off in terms of my assumptions about, you know, granted that one, I think he was probably an outlier cause he was really big 
he was just such a mm-hmm. big lizard, you know? And I think either it was a weird look, it was like a different locality or he was like just a unique animal or he was especially old, you know, something who knows? I don't know, but he was huge, but that's happened yeah. a bunch of times where I'm like, Oh yeah, no, this is definitely an adult. And then I get one that's like, Oh yeah, that's not an adult at all. This is like a sub adult, you know? No. Yeah. Chris and I were just, we're just talking about that with the little, the little South American hognose snakes that I have the, the Xenodont dardignii. Like yeah. I, I, I have a, you know, I have a female and a male and, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to figure out like, hey, what's mature size for an adult female Dorbigny? I don't really know. I can't find that information anywhere online. I've reached out to a couple couple people that breed them and they're like, I don't weigh my snakes. Yeah. I don't know how big they are. And I'm like, that's fine. Yeah, whatever. And, but one person was like, oh, they're about the same size as the tricolors. And it's like, my tricolor female is, she's a pretty, she's a lean one because I keep them a lot leaner than most people do. And she's still over 200 grams. And then I just looked and I found this study of Dorbignia like in, in Brazil. And they had a sample size of 16 females, six of which were gravid. The largest one of the whole bunch was only 56 grams. And the average Whoa. size was 30, 35 grams. And so I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. So this is not, they're not, they're not the same size as tricolors at all. Like, how yeah. do we, you know, it's just so trippy trying to figure that kind of stuff out. And it's still, even that, I'm still like, I don't know, because maybe these more southerly localities of the Dorbini, I get larger. That would make sense to me, you know, yeah. and, and maybe it's just these, these northern localities in Brazil are just on average smaller, but who the hell knows. If anyone out yeah. there is listening to this that, that has kept Dorbini and bred them, hit me up. <laughs> yeah, for real, man. Sorry, yeah. I'm having to. Man, I'm having to inter- interfere with some. Uh, I thought you were just going to give here. us a tour of the no shop. No way, dude. I don't do tours. Not in America. extra for that. No. <laughs> no. Jesus Christ. Lizard, stop it. Sorry. I got a couple that are just beating the living snot out of each other at the moment. So I'm trying to run run interference on these guys and get them to quit. So, yeah. sorry. It's all right. Angry, angry ornates. Not beautiful though. Look at that. Oh yeah, that facial pattern, nice. man. But they're assholes. This one in particular, he's been beating up all his brothers and sisters. Yeah, he's got cool face paint, right? Is he related to Crazy Horse? No, he's not. Actually, they um trying to get the camera to focus a little better here, but he's uh. Oh, that's not gonna work. Yeah, no, he's not related to Crazy Horse. So I actually have some uh. I have some uh, um, weird, weird data this year to talk about how they are. They don't. They don't really breed. I, I don't know how they breed. I don't know what the what the what the causal relationship is between their parentage and their coloration. Because I had I have some that are turning out to look like crazy horse, but they were they were the result of breeding two greens together. And so I'm just like, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, I don't know what this is. Um, how, how many generate, how many generations deep are you? Uh, this year I got to F4, I believe. And, uh, which is great. And then, but, but, um, the, the particular pairing that I'm referring to actually was the result of two animals that I've had, they're wild caught that I've had for a long time, but they, um, I had not crossed these two. Well, actually, one of them. Okay, actually, let me. T- I take that back. I apologize. I misspoke. I did have that happen a couple of times with some of these, where some animals that were, uh, uh, I just had them, and I just happened to never cross this pair, and they were two greens, and they yielded some weird cobalt blue and salmon, but then. There's a clutch right here. I'll probably show you a couple just for fun, but there's a couple in here who their parents were also green. They also happened to be the the result of the only double clutch I've ever had out of one female ornate. And those two animals are first generation captive bred. So hmm. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> so these are F2, I guess. Right? That's how that goes. Am I correct in, in my math? My math on that. If they're, if they're second second generation from the wild, they'd be F2, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Okay, good. I'm glad I'm on track with that. Uh, I'll show you. Hang on. Give me a second. 
Is this like good good viewing of my face? This it's, like a very, it's, a, it's a very active podcast this time. Yeah. yeah. Well, my for those of those listeners uh, out there who have heard our episode that we did with Brandon Hedinger, my employee here at the shop, that poor fella broke his leg, and uh, so has been incapacitated. Therefore, my work here at the shop got a little bit heavier temporarily because I got to make sure Brandon, you know, can take time to heal and do his thing. And so that poor guy. Uh, so that's why I'm having to. That's one reason I'm sitting here doing cleanup while we're doing the podcast is because I. Kind of have to, um, mm-hmm. just, just sort of how it goes. <laughs> that crazy well, guy. Well, while you're while you're playing with those, just because it's got my interest peaked, just because of genetics, <clears throat> you're saying you're getting blue animals from green animals, basically, right? And the and the other way around, yeah. And so you're getting greens from blue animals. Yep. Interesting. So and do you get do you get greens from the greens? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. who freaking knows what's going on? Yeah, who knows? This little fella, green, uh, from a green from the green parentage, and he's like got a blue and orange head. But I can tell he's gonna. They're all kind of this clutch is all in a shed, so I can tell mm. some of them are gonna have both colorations. But you know, another one, green from a green. I mean, blue from a green cross. Uh, this one just sold, but or wait a minute, no, not this guy. Well, it don't matter. Anyway, these guys are wild. Like they're they're just so interesting. It's so weird to see some of their weird variety. But they're they're just, it's I don't know how it works, man. I can't figure it out. And and I and I don't they're they're so far anyway, I just can't find the rhyme or reason that points mm-hmm. to how they're inheriting the color because there are some that do end up turning out and looking exactly like their parents, you know? And then some that look nothing like their parents and some that don't even look like their grandparents, some that just pop out Mm. random colors. So there's some, there's some kind of heritability happening, but I just don't know how, I don't know the mechanism by which they're passing down certain looks. And I've tried, like, I've tried, you know, I, I make different pairs and, and you'll, you know, you'll see, in one clutch, the influence of one father that spreads across, like for example, if one male fathers four clutches in a season, you'll see the influence of that male in all his babies, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're all going to turn out in the same way. You know, it just means you can kind of see, like there's one male I'm thinking of in particular, my group, one of my adult green boys who he, he just, every female he breeds, you can kind of see his influence in the offspring, big, bold patterns, They have uh, some of the males end up having relatively similar color development. But like, then I had like, for example, I posted up on my Instagram, this super nice male who's like looking by color, who's like, I I put him up just, just a couple of days, just a couple of days ago. He's real dark at the moment, but this guy, and he's a real monster. He's huge for, you know, for his age. This guy looks, looks a lot like his dad, but then his direct brother, is he's like a cobalt and salmon. This is the same clutch. Whoa. Same exact clutch. And he's like, I've never seen one this color, like this patina of orange and and blue. I've never had one that looks like this. I don't know where. And he's the only one in the clutch that looks this way. Um, So it's like, I don't know where the hell, I don't know. I don't have any idea. You know, so there's some reproducibility. I mean, they clearly you know, they'll follow some trends, mm-hmm. but they just don't, it, I just don't know. I, 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 I'm not even sure it's the kind of thing I could easily figure out. It would be hard to work out. It would probably take t- dozens of years and lots that's, of different. Yeah. That's partly why I asked about what generation you were on. Cause I feel like by fourth or fifth generation, you kind of would have streamlined certain looks, mm-hmm. but it sounds well, like that's really not what's going on. Yeah. And I mean, I think if I had, if I had taken the animals and done really specific close breedings where like, you know, I, you know, maybe, maybe even do one or two generations of, of line breeding and then kind of see how stuff pans out, then might, maybe there would have been a more visible ratio, but like everything I do is very, it's almost randomized. Like by all means, I, I take, I, I do take and make some specific pairings because I'm like, 
it'd be kind of cool to see what these two produce. And while these two have like exceptional high coloration, even for adults, maybe if I breed these two together, we'll get some even more intense babies. Right. Um, but, uh, but most of it has been relatively random where I'm like, well, that one's unrelated to that one. Let's do it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So because of that, you know, I, I don't know if I've maybe shot myself in the foot a little bit with, in that regard, but, um, it, it it's at least one way. Now I do have some where like, for example, I have a, a female who produced, uh, a big group of, a big, you know, like a clutch of 26, I held back five sisters from that clutch who all had relatively similar looks and I bred all but one of those sisters to the same male and all of their babies actually tend to look pretty similar. Like those ones all look pretty similar, but like the same, like the, that, that, that last sister, that fifth sister bred to this other green male produced totally random all over the place clutch. And then like, I've bred a lot of those sisters for two years in a row. And um, when I've swapped males uh, in those two years in a row, I get very, very different things. But I also get different things even when I've bred the same pair together, where it's like, this is the same pair. You know, like Crazy Horse is a great example. The the cobalt and salmon male that everybody sees on my pages that everybody loves all the time. Mm-hmm. He, he, I bred him for four years before I got a, a male from him. For some reason, a bunch of females, tur- or a, I mean, a bunch of his babies turned out female and I couldn't find, I like just never, never found a male by the time I sold stuff. I just never pulled. It doesn't mean that that doesn't mean there weren't males in the clutches. It right. doesn't mean that like I had sold them. finding them. Yeah. Well, I just wasn't finding them. I kept selecting ones I thought were male and ending up with females. And so like, I never even found a male from him, but I've got two, two of his sons out there. One that looks absolutely identical to him and one that looks like totally different but it's from the same pair, him and this one female that I've bred for like 10 years in a row. And I've never seen like the one brother who looks super different, never popped out of that pairing before. You know, it's just, I don't get it, man. I don't know. I don't have any idea what's going on. Help. <laughs> so anyway, you're a master. I can't help. I don't know anything about this stuff. Well, thanks for nothing. Nothing to contribute. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> We, we'll oh, just su- we'll just support you. How's that? We'll just support. Uh, that's fine, I guess. If you have to. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to like sidetrack the whole conversation and make it about euros. I think um, people are going to enjoy. I enjoyed that. that was well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. That makes me happy. I'm. I enjoyed it. You know. Um, now we I can talk to- about Spilotes and how they inherit color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should. Tell me about Spilotes and how they inherit color. I don't know anything about I, it. I, I don't know anything about it either. I'm, I, I, everything I thought I knew, I don't know because all these babies, they all look weird and some of them have red and orange and stuff that neither of the adults have. And who knows where that comes from? I don't know. Right. How, are those, how are those babies doing, Roy? They're good. They're really good. Yeah. they're um, Most are either just had or about to have their second shed. Was it, um, was it 13 or 16 or what was the clutch size? 16. 16. Yeah. Which is That's a big clutch. Big. Yeah, big for big snakes. For, um, yeah, so I got plenty. A few of them are already accounted for, but um, I'm going to bring a bunch to the to the Super Show and they're ready. They're eating pinkies and some few of them are ready to eat fuzzies, but Damn. That's amazing. I mean, they they honestly could eat a fuzzy out of the egg. It's just that they're scared of everything, you know. And so giving them smaller stuff to start is good. But um, there it's pretty amazing watching them, watching them. And a, a lot of them, it seems like, are it seems like there's two general themes in terms of the coloration that I'm noticing. And there's some that are kind of more lighter colored overall, but they have this like red and orange showing up. And then there are some that are more high contrast, like black that look like they're trending toward black and yellow, like my big male. That's awesome. Who knows how they're actually going to look in three years when they're adults, but it seems like those are the two general trends I'm seeing. That's pretty cool. It's fun, man. It's like, it's, it's cool. And, And I feel like it's fun to play around with like the way that we expect them to turn out, you know, because in some ways I, I can appreciate situations where there's a level of predictability, you know, Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether that's in, 
you, you know, like you get you get like a normal leopard gecko and breed it to a normal leopard gecko. You kind of have an idea of what what's going to pop out of that for the most part, right? And then you can get some level of certainty when you you know say you breed like you know if you have like a, some kind of genetic mutation in there. Okay, I can appreciate that level of certainty too. But something I really really love about the about ornates and and even apparently it looks like these spilotes too is I love. Oh yeah, look at that! Jesus Christ, the thing's huge. Yeah, well, this is the yearling that I held back from the same pairing, though. Super stunner. But, wow. Yeah. It's kind of hard Did to you see. You get the that coloration. thing to hold still, Roy. God damn it. I, it's, I mean, I'm trying, I keep trying to ask her to, I'm trying to teach her, but you can see she's got these cool orange, yeah, orange and red stripes coming in on her tail. Yeah. I'm yeah. Like, where the hell is that coming from? And here right. it's, I mean, the color's all washed out, but it's like this like rainbow of color. Yeah. 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 Weird snake. Yeah, but so uh, it is weird snake, in fact. But that's uh, that's kind of one of the that's one of the things I like about stuff like ornata or in this you know in this case Spilotes is I love I like when you don't know what you're going to get in some way. You know, it's it's kind of fun to say like, look, I know this is a male or I know this is a female, but in terms of the way it's going to look as an adult, your guess is as good as mine. This could be anything. I think that's really fun because then then watching the way they develop you know, and seeing the way the color comes up and push it, you know, like pushes one direction, pulls another direction, you know, they, Absolutely. they, you know, it, I think that's extremely fun to watch. Um, I think, uh, anyway, I, so I, I, I think it's fun, but I, at the same time, I, there's a frustrating aspect to it. So with some yeah. of the, with some of the king snakes that I've got going, some of these locality king snakes, um, some of them, some of my pairs are wild caught or they're, you know, F1 and, you know, you expect certain looks out of babies based on what the parents look like, right? Yeah. So I had, I had a clutch this. I had a clutch this year from some cow kings. Female is relatively banded, uh, kind of a hyper melanistic look, so she's darker. And the male just a wacky pattern, right? Crazy, wacky, aberrant, super dark. All the babies were literally like cookie cutters of each other, uh, and neither one of them looked like mom or dad. They're just like darker looking banded mm. cow kings. It's just so weird. There's really neat, um, yeah, you know, but it, at the same time, it was a little bit frustrating. It's like, man, why aren't any like really cool looking? I mean, they're really cool looking, but it kind of makes you wonder. Okay, well, if I did the pairing again, would they be the same? Would it be yeah. different? Yeah. You know, was it was it the temperature they were incubated at? You know, right, or, right. I think there's factors we don't really consider. You know, because maybe, Bill, maybe with your your euros, depending on where the eggs are in the incubator or how they are in proximity to each other. Maybe that has something to do with how the pattern lays down or the yeah. color, you know, it's, it's hard. It's really hard to say. I mean, Oh yeah. And I'm just grasping at straws, but who knows, you know? No, same. I mean, at this point, your guess is as good as mine. You know, I've done, I've done a lot of work with, um, well, not a lot, but I've done some playing with temperature, you know, to see what temperature does in terms of affecting things. And with some species like Thomas, I, it, and Yemenensis, it does seem that if you incubate warmer, like on the warmer end of the spectrum, you do seem to get a little bit more in the way of males. Um, mm. But it's it's not cut and dry, and it's not perfect, you know. And it's it's just more of like a general trend. It's not we're not talking eighty percent male. We're talking like sixty sixty two percent of ma their males. You know what I mean? So, but whereas if you incubate a little bit lower, you're getting like a right even split. And sometimes mm -hmm. even almost all female, if you incubate, like I've incubated warm for Ornata before and gotten mostly females too. So it's like, it's not perfect. And then Josh Markey recently sent me, I haven't read it yet, but he sent me an article that was talking about how actually like moisture is actually a bigger factor. Like, like moisture levels are a bigger factor than temperature in some animals. Mm. And they're starting to, you know, and I, I, again, I'd have to read the paper. I could forward it to both of you guys. Um, I'd be curious. Yeah. 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 Same because it, it, it's, it's pretty cool. It's like, th there's a thing where they're talking about how it's like, Oh, moisture could be a bigger factor in determining sex, which kind of makes sense too. If you think about it, like that would make more sense in some ways than, than actual just flat temperature. I guess, mm -hmm. but I mean, even, even just sort of like intuitively, like temperature seems like the weirdest thing to me to influence sex in some regard, mm -hmm. whereas moisture seems like way more direct, but I don't know. That's, that is, that is me speaking with absolutely no authority or understanding about chemistry, biochemistry, nothing that's absolute flagrant nonsense on my part. So ignore me in that, in, in that regard. 
Um, but it was still a cool thing. I have to read the article. I'd like to take a look at it. Um, but also like, I kind of have trouble with the predictability in some ways, right? Like I, 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 I don't get me wrong. I love knowing that like, okay, this animal looks just like his dad and that guy looked just like his grandfather. I love having that kind of, that, uh, predictability in, 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 in lineage. And it does help in some ways because some people will come to you looking for a specific thing, you know? And, and I hear that, like I, I, there's obviously space for that and I'm down and I love it. Um, but also, uh, there, there, there's two things that I think about one, one being, if you, if you're thinking about, um, uh, like eth- ethic, ethical choice, Um, and let's say you're talking about Euromastix or Nada, everybody wants males. Like the, the, the average consumer of Euromastix or Nada wants a male. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, like I, I can appreciate that people kind of want what they want. And so I can also imagine kind of tinkering with things to sort of drive it towards that direction. It's like, well, if more people want males, then I'm going to hatch more males. Um, on the other hand, if like, you know, I've resisted ever getting my animals DNA tested, you know, with sheds to try to get their sex because like you shouldn't not want the animal if it's female, you know, I mean, it mm-hmm. kind of starts to, you know, it starts to look like this, you know, like China's one child only policy where they preferentially go for male children over female children. It's like, what? Like I, mm-hmm. I you should like them either way, you know? And, and, and it, uh, I don't know. It just seems like it could, it could lead in a weird direction. If I started knowing for sure, always what I'm getting and started leaning and choosing preferentially for that. Like what if there's gotta be some, a weird like byproduct of not like letting it be somewhat random. I don't know. I, I honestly, this is again, speaking of pure speculation on my part, you know, like yeah, this, this is something that kind of makes me think about that. It's like, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like it, it's kind of a good thing to let it rip and just let it be, let it be kind of random. And actually, you know, if you're going to, you should take the risk. And if I don't know if this is a male or a female, then you should be psyched, whichever it turns out, because it's not like females are ugly, you know? And I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I got a little weird there. Not really sure. (laughs) I I don't think it's weird. weird. I, I, no, I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. What'd you say, Roy? I said, you're always getting weird on us, Phil. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do tend to. I do tend to. Um, anyway. Yeah. So, uh, Chris, well, we, we no. Go last ahead, Roy. time go ahead. Chris was on the show, yeah, we alluded to a certain story that Chris has that he was <laughs> he was interested in potentially sharing with us, but we didn't actually get to it. Um, we got a little bit off the rails last time, as I recall. Um, I think some sake might have been involved in the show, something like that. Um, but in any case. Chris, um, I'm curious if you feel like now it could be potentially a good time to to share that little story. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely definitely share the story. So, um, as we talk about you know the reptile collection, people not knowing what I have, there's there's only a handful mm-hmm. of people that kind of know this story, <clears throat> mainly because I didn't think it was, um, I didn't want to go around sharing it like I'm boasting about it or that uh, that I'm proud in any way or that it was a fun experience. Cause it, it was, I'm not proud of it. It was not a fun experience. Um, it was a fascinating experience, but, um, by no means do I ever want to have to deal with it again. But, um, yeah, about a year and a half ago, I, I took a bite from a Hellerai, Southern Pacific rattlesnake. And, uh, and it was, it was crazy. Um, the day actually was a really good day. I'd have been out herping and, um, Got to see wild Harris hawks in California. For those of you that don't know about wow. birds of prey, um, Harris hawks rarely come into California. Usually they're transient, uh, just kind of on the borders, <laughs> either near Mexico or Arizona. But uh, happened to see a pair. It was like a it was a, it was a great day. You know, um, I was down by the border of Mexico, so it kind of made sense. But <laughs> um, ended up collecting a a female Hellerai. Uh, she was just this beautiful snake, you know, chocolate brown. She had pink, uh, pink mm-hmm. on her little ocelli with a little bit of l- lemon. Frosting isn't the right word, but there was some like lemon yellow, just one of the prettiest mm-hmm. rattlesnakes I'd seen. Um, I collected her for a friend who was kind of putting together um, 
a Snakes of California poster for the Department of Fish and Wildlife because um, he wanted to photograph stuff that looked a little bit different. And this was just a beautiful snake. So we got to get a photo mm-hmm. of this thing for this for this educational outreach outreach uh, situation. So anyway, I had the mm-hmm. snake. I wasn't planning on collecting anything, but I always have like a bag in my car and a plastic container, like a Tupperware container in my car. Just, just that's just the Herper thing, right? So I mm-hmm. um, was able to bag it up, which I'm not a fan of bagging venomous stuff, but you know, if you're careful, there's ways to do it. So I got her bagged up, mm-hmm. um, got her in the, in the plastic container in the car and went back to my hotel room. It was getting late at that point. So it was, it was about eight o'clock. I'm in my hotel room and in my mind, I was like, you know, I'm really concerned that she's going to poop in this bag and there's going to be vapor lock and she's going to suffocate in the bag. So even though the bag was in a plastic container, I really wanted to get her out of the bag and into just the plastic container. And um, Long story short, I got bit, got bit through the pillowcase um, mm. with one fang into my thumb. And uh, I've never felt so stupid in my life. Uh, just, just how could you be so dumb? You're an idiot. Um, and I immediately on my cell phone, I dialed 911 and just waited. I was like, maybe I got lucky because there was no pain from the bite. There's no pain, nothing. But okay, maybe it was a dry bite. Maybe I got lucky, but uh, in less than a minute, the tip of my tongue started to tingle. And it's like, well, crap. All right. Um, <laughs> which a little sidetrack, uh, with how fast my tongue tingled. Uh, if you get bit, there's no way you can suck the venom out. Like it's, it's in you. Don't, don't waste time. Yeah. You know, these little remedies, the suction cups, sucking the venom, cutting your skin. Just, it's not worth it. It's, it's, it's too mm-hmm. late. Once you get bit, it's too late, right? Mm-hmm. Chris, can, can I can I really just pause you for a quick second and ask? Sure. Um, when, so when you got bit, was there like a moment of like, nah, nothing's going to actually happen? Was there like a, a moment of that? Like, I don't know, because I would imagine like, I could imagine one or one of two things happening. I could imagine getting bit and then overreacting and thinking, Oh shit, I'm totally screwed. Like, Oh my God, Oh my God, Oh my God. And like panic. Or I could imagine getting bit and not necessarily feeling anything in that immediate 30 seconds and thinking, eh, maybe I'm fine. Maybe it's not really that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe venom's not real or like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I would say it was probably like 75, 25 or like I'm totally mm-hmm. screwed. And there's a glimmer of hope that maybe it was a dry bite. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I was, again, I was immediately felt like an idiot. I was immediately scared. I wouldn't say I was in panic mode. I really tried to keep myself as calm as possible, but, um, I can't, you know, telling someone to stay calm when they get bit by a rattlesnake, unless you've been bit, you, it's, it's, uh, it's a weird experience. It's hard to, it's hard to tell someone how to react to something when they haven't ever reacted to it, if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. it's like, you can go ahead and jump off this diving board. You're going to be fine when you hit the water, but until you actually do it, you don't know how you're going to react. If that makes sense. So yeah. they're trying to stay calm. Had 911 on my phone, hadn't dialed it. Um, and I think maybe some of my nerves were the, this praying that maybe it was a dry bite. When I felt my tongue tingle, there was an almost an odd sense of, well, all right, we got to go do this. So it was almost like a relief, but not in a positive way. Like, okay, now I now I have an answer. Um, called nine one one. They must get a lot of non venomous snake bite calls because the guy on the phone didn't really initially. I don't think he he thought that I'd really been bit by a rattlesnake. And I'm like, hey man, I got bit by a rattlesnake. And okay, you got a snake bite? I'm like, no, no, no. Here's a rattlesnake bite. Rattlesnake. I know, I know it's a rattlesnake. Mm-hmm. I know what's happening. Here's my symptoms. And so he's like, where are you? What's going on? So I give him the address to the hotel. Of course, I'm on the second floor, which makes things great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And as we're talking, as we're talking, so the tingling goes from the tip of my tongue, through my tongue, into my mouth. I can feel it like kind of spreading through my face, right? And this is all oh, this is all less than two minutes from the bite. I'm feeling the tingling in my face. And <sighs> um, that's wild. Kind of like... Um, a cross between like when your foot falls asleep, but also you got numbed up by a dentist, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yep. the tingly, but not like a painful tingle. Um, and as that tingling went, you know, through my head, down to my neck, it, you know, radiated out down through my arms and my fingers and then through my whole body. And it was probably, 
uh, maybe maybe three minutes, maybe four minutes total before my whole body was just like I said buzzing because I don't know how else to describe it besides buzzing. Mm-hmm. Um, was there was I it think, pain? Was there like a level of pain at this point, or was it mostly just discomfort and weirdness? Uh, there, there was there was no pain. Uh, it, was, it was like I said, very odd sensation. That's the fascinating mm-hmm. part. Is just. Um, just the actual, it's happening to me right now. This is fascinating. I was terrified, of course. Um, yeah. But, you know, hindsight, it just fascinating how, again, it was only a single fang bite, too. She didn't get both fangs into me. And I don't know how much she put in me, but, you know, when you think about things that are toxic, like, oh, you got to drink this much drain cleaner to die or, you know, whatever <laughs> it is, it's like this, in comparison, minuscule amount of venom is like jacking me up really hard right now. Yeah, so, yeah. So once, so I'm on the phone, I'm relaying all my information to the the tech or the whoever's on the phone. I don't know the tech anyway, the emergency response person, you know, this is where I am. This is my room. This is, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, the snakes are contained. It's safe. It's fine. Um, you know, I, they're like, okay, well, how's your breathing? You know, can you breathe? And, um, because I was tingly and this includes like my teeth, you know, the inside of my mouth, my throat, um, mm-hmm. I assumed I was swallowing, you know, as your mouth gets, you know, saliva in it. it. I'm I'm going through the motions, but I can't feel if I'm like swallowing properly or not or anything mm-hmm. like that. Um, it's okay, you know, go ahead. You know, they're on their way. Go ahead and sit down. And uh, they had said, yeah, fire is going to come too. Fire is going to break the door down because, of course, I'd locked my door because I'm at a hotel. And I'm like, crap. So, you know, part of me, I'm thinking well, this is going to be really expensive medically. And it's like, what, they're going to break the door to a hotel. Like, okay, I don't want to pay for that. Mm-hmm. So this yeah. is, again, this is probably four minutes post by, and I had slumped down on the couch that was there in the hotel room. And it's okay, well, I got to get up and get this door open. And it was, if either of you have ever been just like totally trash drunk where you can barely move, barely stand, that's what it was, except for my brain still worked exactly normal i didn't have like the drunk brain mm-hmm. at all but my body it was to move the, uh, the 10 to move the 10 feet from the couch to the door just to unlock the door was just an insane amount of concentration because my body just didn't want to let me do it i just couldn't i couldn't that's my legs crazy out. um wow. so got the door open and actually threw my suitcase in between the door so that it would like wedge the door open so when they got there they could just come right in and so then I went back and sat on the couch. And at that point uh, was probably the scariest point because I just felt, you know, not being able to walk. My, my, my fine motor skills were totally shot. And I'm thinking, well, this is how I die on the couch in a hotel room. And I'm talking to emergency medical services. I'm not talking to my wife. I can't tell her what's going on because I don't want to not be on the phone with EMS. Right. And um, I just was reserved to the fact that this, I'm going to die right now. Like I'm, I'm going to die. And um, oh, just, just really scary it could be, again because this is minutes. It's so fast. Anything I'd ever seen yeah. on National Geographic or Animal Planet, it's like, oh, you know, for 20, 30 minutes, and then I got this and that, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, this was mm-hmm. like, I am jacked up right now. Yeah, yeah. So the medics show up, they come in, you know, they didn't want to come in. They thought that there was, I don't know if they thought it was going to be like Indiana Jones thing where there's just snakes everywhere or whatever. But yeah. They didn't want to come in like, are the snakes contained? Is it safe? Is it safe? And yes, get in here. It's fine. So they come in and the guy hooks me up to machines and he's like, all right. He's like, I know you're really scared. He's like, your blood pressure is shockingly. He's like, your blood pressure is totally normal. Your heart rate is fine. It's a little elevated, but of course it is. And he's Mm -hmm. like, you're going to be fine. He's like, I know you think you're going to die. He's like, you're going to be fine. It's like, I've dealt with snake bites before. You're going to be totally cool. No worries. Mm -hmm. So then like, can you, can you walk? And I hadn't tried to walk. And again, this is only now we're about eight minutes post bite. So Mm-hmm. They got there pretty quick. I said, well, I, you know, I, I kind of stumbled to the door to get the door open. Maybe I can, maybe I can walk. And they tried to help me stand up and it was, I had like jello legs. Like I couldn't, could not support my body at, at all. Wow. <laughs> so, wild. so they had to run down, get the cart, got the cart, got me into the, got me into the ambulance, got me hooked up. I said, Hey, you're going to run an IV. And they're like, uh, I guess we could, you know, we, I mean, everything's fine. Um, mm-hmm. I was okay. I was like, well, are you going to intubate? And they're like, well, how's your breathing? Well, I can breathe fine. Like, we're not going to do anything if we don't have to. And I was like, well, I, you know, I don't know what's happening. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're, they're calling different hospitals, trying to find which hospital is closest, but also has the antivenin. Mm-hmm. And, right. Uh, 
I said, you know, they're, they're trying to talk about like, Oh, you, you guys looking for crow fab. Cause at the time I was only aware of crow fab kind of being like the standard, mm-hmm. but uh, anyway, they figure out the hospital they're going to take me to. And that, that ambulance ride felt like it took forever, but really it was probably only a 10 minute ride. Uh, yeah. I know, I know during that I got really sleepy um, and mm-hmm. it was the only point during the entire time um, before I got any actual treatment where I actually felt sleepy, which I assume is, it could have been nerves and stress or it could have been venom related when my body's just like, yeah, we got to shut down. Mm-hmm. But I, told, yeah. I told, I told the medic, I was like, man, I'm feeling really sleepy right now. And I was trying, you know, to the best I could of my ability, relay every little symptom, you know, every little mm-hmm. symptom, just because I don't know. And then every information for them yeah. is really helpful. So uh, he's like, well, if you're tired, you can just close your eyes and let go go to sleep. And then in my brain, it was like, I'm not going to wake up if I go to sleep. So I'm not going yeah. to sleep. So, yeah. um, so I, I get in, I get into the hospital and, um, you know, this is, it's post COVID, but still kind of COVID. So, you know, everybody's mm-hmm. wearing masks. They had to put a mask on me. Um, you know, there was no mask on me in the ambulance or anything, but in the hospital I had to wear a mask. And so when I show up, there's like eight different people all standing there. It was a kind of a slow night there in the ER. Mm-hmm. And there's a bunch of people standing there. They're all excited because snake bites don't happen very frequently. And so everybody wants to, you know, see the idiot that got bit by a snake. Um, Look at this so they, dummy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't feel any, any kind of cool at all. So, um, so now it's, it's about eight 30. So maybe half an hour post by they get me into an ER, they get me into a room and they, they run an IV at that point, take my blood. They run my blood up, my blood work, and they come back and they're like, "Well, your white cell count isn't elevated. We don't think you have like a serious envenomation, so we're you know we're not going to administer any kind of antivenin." And so for me, it's like, "Great, this is phenomenal." Even though I've got all these symptoms, I'm thinking, "Well, it must not be enough. Maybe that's why there's no pain." That mm-hmm. right, you know, just a mild envenomation. This is kind of normal. So you know, and everybody's talking to me like, "Hey, have you called your family, your wife, or anything?" I'm like, "I'm not calling anybody until we know exactly what's going on, because that's the worst thing to do." Is, "Hey, babe, I got bit by rattlesnake. I'll talk to you later." Like, I don't want to freak her out. So, um, <laughs> I think I waited a little over an hour. They ran my blood work a second time, and still they were like, "No, your blood work is is coming back fine. We're not going to administer any venom." Like, okay, well, that's that's two times you told me that. Okay, good. Well, I'll, you know, I'll call mm-hmm. my wife. So I call Kimberly, and you know, first thing, hey, just you know first part of the conversation, I, everything's fine. I'm safe. Everything's okay. However, I'm in the hospital, got bit by a rattlesnake. And, you know, so she immediately, my brother was living with us at the time. Immediately I'm on speakerphone and we're talking and trying to figure out how to, how to do things, but what the course of action is and say, look, they're saying I'm fine. I don't need any venom. You know, I don't know how long I'm going to be here, but just want to let you know, you know, you know, and I didn't want to make it a long drawn out conversation on the phone. But mm-hmm. Sure. Anyway, it's about an, another hour later. So we're getting closer to like 10 or 1030. And the toxicologist shows up and the toxicologist comes in. Hey, how you doing? He looks at my chart and looks at me and he's like, why haven't they given you antivenin? Like he was pissed off. Like he didn't say why the mm-hmm. F haven't they given you antivenin? But that was like his tone. Like why the F haven't they given you antivenin? It's like, well, you can swear. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> he didn't know, swear. He didn't swear. So I'm going to swear anyway. Right. right. Um, He's looking at my, she's like, why haven't they given you antivenin? I was like, well, they, they said my blood work was fine. You know, my wife's like, he's like, look at you. <laughs> he's like, you're having a full on envenomation. He's like, can you feel the twitches? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, your face is twitching right now. Give me your phone. So <laughs> I gave, I gave him my cell phone. He recorded my face and my face is just like twitching. Like there's almost like there's bugs crawling underneath it. Just like oh my craziness, God. right? Just the and he's like, you need wow. antivenin. He's like, you needed it when you came in. He's like, what were they thinking? And he's wow. like, he's like, look, he's like, just so you know, when you're a venom case, he's like, the ER doctor is not your doctor. The toxicologist is your doctor. Don't deal with them. Like I'm the one you need to deal with. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, this is not a normal yeah. thing for me. So, you know, tell well, me what you got to, you know. And you didn't, and how, and like, if, if the toxicologist wasn't there, you know what I mean? Like, how are you going to be, you know, it's like, hey, just so you know, you, the ER doc isn't your doctor. I am. It's like, you weren't here, bro. What am I supposed to say to the ER doc? You know, right. oh, like, right. yeah, listen here, doctor. <laughs> right. You know? That's a weird thing to say. I mean, I can understand the frustration, but it, that's a bit of a weird reaction, I think. Right. And I think, I think his reaction was I'd been in the hospital for close to two hours with effectively no treatment. And he's probably panicked yeah. like, crap, this guy's going to have way worse reaction than he would have otherwise. Right. So he said, no, we're going to get you antivenin. 
He's like, are you in any pain? I was like, no, there's no, there's no real pain right now. I mean, there was, so at that point, the swelling had kind of radiated from my thumb into my hand and was a little bit up into my forearm, but not, not crazy swelling. Still no official pain from like venom type stuff, um, which was great. Uh, so they start, uh, they're like, okay, we're going to write you up for the antivenin. So I'm waiting, waiting. And then at that point, the pain like hit me like a brick wall. And it felt because the swelling in my hand and my wrist, it felt like my bones are kind of being pulled apart. Uh, and so that was just incredibly painful. Jeez. Um, and, you know, I was very clear. I was like, you guys aren't, I was like, I know I'm swelling up. I was like, no, you're not cutting me open. Like you're not doing a fasciotomy. I'm not, I'm not cool with that. And it wasn't even to that point, but I was just like, just, you know, if it gets to that point, you're not, you're not doing that. We'll, we'll do something else. But, uh, mm-hmm. which the toxicologist was of course, totally fine with, um, so then they start trying to chase the pain with morphine and they're like, well, let's, you know, we're going to give you however many milligrams. It's the kind of the standard for like a gunshot victim. Okay, great. Well, that maybe that's the same kind of pain level. That morphine did nothing for me. Did absolutely nothing. Mm. I couldn't feel it. Like oh. nothing. I said, well, we can only give you so much more as like a chaser. And then we can't give you any more again for another three hours or whatever the, whatever the mm-hmm. time frame is. I said, well, just, you know, give it to me. I mean, I, I, I'm, it, Freaking hurts, you know? Mm-hmm. And so about every half an hour or so, I'd been calling Kimberly, kind of giving her updates. And I think one of the last times I called her, I said, look, this is what's going on. This is the new change. I'm in a, a crazy amount of pain right now. I can't talk to you because I'm just going to yell because it hurts so bad. I got to go, you know? Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to yell at her. Not, of course, none of it's her fault. You know, I mean, little things were frustrating me, of mm-hmm. course, because that just trying to like not be screaming in pain because I don't want to be that guy in the ER. And of course, mm-hmm. it's my fault too, but. Anyway, um, they finally started administering antivenin, and uh, which was great. I'd had double vision a little bit, kind of on and off. It was like if I blinked really heavy and opened my eyes, I'd be cross-eyed, and then I could blink again real heavy, and then my eyes were, were normal, which is kind of kind of interesting. Um, and it didn't really ever persist, but that was the only, I guess, neurologic besides my muscles not working kind of symptom I had. Um, once the antivenin started to be administered, it was shocking how well it worked. And, um, basically their, their course of action is to administer antivenin, uh, to the point that the swelling stops progressing. So I think by the time I'd had my first round, the swelling had kind of gotten into my bicep a little bit. And, uh, you know, every, I think every half an hour they were doing measurements and they'd marked on my arm where they were taking the measurements. Everybody could measure in the same spots just to kind of track the swelling. So after that first round of antivenin, uh, which each round is about 10 vials, and they used, um, they did not use Crofab, they used Anavip. Anavip. Mm. So mm-hmm. um, it's a little, I guess it's cheaper to manufacture. It, it works the same, if not better. Um, and it's a broad spectrum for a lot of different Viper bites. Um, anyway, so after that, it was shocking. It was like, oh, almost all the pain is gone. Oh, I can stand up again. Uh, it was insane how well that first round worked and it's like, well, this is great, you know? And after that first round had been administered, they actually got me up into a, into a room. So I was able to get out of the ER into a room and, uh, it's okay, great. And they're like, all right, you know, we'll get you, get you all set up, you know, here's your gown, whatever. And like, we'll come check on you in a few hours. And at that point I was like, I was feeling really good. So like, well, I'm going to go to sleep. So I slept for a couple hours and woke up and I was back in just insane amount of pain. Mm-hmm. And I said, all right, I called the. You know, I called on my phone and said, hey, I need another dose, man. I need, I need some more antivenin. Like, all this pain is back. I can't stand up anymore. The tingling is all crazy. And the charge nurse that night, which is apparently she's having a bad night because she was not in a good mood. But they did, they did get me a second round of antivenin, um, which helped. Uh, I was able to go back to sleep. And uh, sometime middle of the next day, so now we're, now we're Thursday. So we're about, we're about 16 hours post-bite now. Mm-hmm. Uh, the head toxicologist comes in with some new students. And he's like, Hey, I got some, some students working with me. You know, is it okay if they come in and we talk about you? I was like, I'm all about it, man. Like, I'm not proud of this, but let's get something positive out of it. And, you know, yeah. talk to people about everything. And so we went through all my symptoms and like how fast they progressed and everything. And, you know, of course, students have questions about, you know, well, do I have to be afraid? Of, you know, cause they don't, you know, they're not snake people. You know, do I have to be afraid? Is it going to chase me? You know, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. The standard, standard non-reptile question. Uh, from people, mm-hmm. you know, so we didn't, we did end up doing a third round of antivenin kind of middle of the day, Thursday. And that was the last antivenin I got. So I got 30 vials and, uh, the swelling had finally stopped progressing. It went slightly into my, you know, from my shoulder into my right bicep a little bit. 
uh, not bicep, I'm sorry, uh, pectoralis, the chest a little bit. Mm-hmm. And that was the big thing is they really wanted to keep the swelling out of my chest. Um, so they mostly did that. So that was fine. Um, and again, after the second or third round, I was able to, you know, I didn't have great motor skills cause I'm, I'm super tingly. So I can't really feel exactly what's going on. Um, but I was able to, you know, stand up, walk around, be able to get a shower, which is really nice after a long day of herping and then being in the hospital, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. this, gr- this grungy guy. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, that, that was, you know, pretty good. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Friday at noon, I got released. Kimberly had flown down, um, picked up my car cause I, I'd driven my car down there. She picked up my car from the hotel, came and picked me up and we drove home that Friday. So, um, all in all, it was a very wow. short hospital experience. Um, with that being said, there were symptoms that lasted quite a bit longer. So really? the tingling, the, the tingling and the buzzing in my body that lasted for probably four or five weeks before it fully was out of my body where I didn't feel like I was tingling. Wow. And initially it was like the most annoying thing ever. Um, it's crazy how fast your body can adapt to change because by the, you know, middle of the first night, I was totally used to the tingly and it was like normal, you know, it was normal, not really normal, mm-hmm. but I, it didn't bother me. Um, I just immediately got used to it. And that's why, again, that lasted for probably four or five weeks. Um, when the tingling, as the tingling did subside, it kind of went from the extremities farthest from the bite first. So, you know, obviously my feet and my legs and torso. Um, and then I had tingling in these three fingers, the tips of these three fingers for probably almost another month after. And I actually thought that I was just going to be numb in those fingers, the tips of those fingers for the rest of my life, um, just because mm-hmm. of how long it lasted. Um, wow. But, you know, it, it's all come back. So thankfully, I, you know, I've got full motor skills. I had no tissue loss that's visible anyway. Um, and I, I'm sure some people will like to, I, I've talked to people who have had rattlesnake bites and asked about this one particular, this one particular symptom uh, that happened. Um, and, you know, since you said I can swear, I can go ahead and talk about this. But uh, I, I wasn't getting morning wood the entire time I was tingling. Like, <laughs> like no erections uh, at all, like nothing. I'm like, that is super, super weird. And so I asked whoa. some other guys that had been bit by rattlesnake, like, did you guys ever have the symptom? And none of them experienced that. And I'm like, well, huh. that's not ideal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Suboptimal. <laughs> with, uh, with that being said, uh, I do have two kids and that was post bite. So everything's fine. Um, <laughs> But that was that was probably the <laughs> oddest, one of the oddest uh, symptoms. Not to make too light of the situation, but just um, again, just a fascinating facet of of the whole situation. So um, now that we're getting we're coming up on close to two years post bite, you know, for the first year or so, I, I said you know, everything's totally fine. There is now that we're getting close to two years. There is some what I think is degenerative tissue loss in in this joint of my thumb, like this. I think it's mm. the thenar, thenar joint. Mm-hmm. So that joint will get kind of stiff. Um, and it could just be me. I did construction for a long time. So maybe my hands are just jacked up anyway. But um, that's the only thing I could think of that maybe was a long-term effect officially apart from mm-hmm. financial costs or whatnot. But wow. um, I just have to say, like, you know, when I look back, um, had I been bit out in the field, uh, whether I was trying to collect a snake or not, uh, I'd have been just super screwed. There's no mm-hmm. way where I was when I collected that snake, if I had been bit by her where I found her, that I'd been able to get back to my car. There's no way. Um, I mean, at best, I might have crawled part of the way back, but I would have just been out in the dirt somewhere hoping that some EMTs could find me or a helicopter. I don't know what the protocol would have been. Um, wow. So if anything, I'm just thankful that that went down that way. But um, yeah, super, super scary. It definitely changed my perspective on keeping venomous. I'd kept a rattlesnake here or there kind of throughout keeping herps the last 20 plus years. And it's like, mm-hmm. you know, I really don't know if I want to do that again. Um, not that I, there's anything against them, but it's like, you know, let's take a step back and really reevaluate. You know, it, it, when I've kept them, I've thought that my protocols were pretty good. And I would say that they're pretty good, but there's more facets that I hadn't considered um, mm-hmm. that I obviously need to consider now. And not even talking about having a family and kids, but just in general, financially having access to anti-venin, um, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So, um, and I've heard people after the bite, Oh, I can't, I'm so excited to get this rattlesnake. And I tell them like, you know what, you really, 
you really don't know what you're getting into. And I didn't know mm-hmm. what I was getting into, you know, obviously keeping my first hot snake, but, um, you know, there's all these facets to consider because sometimes healthcare won't cover bites and, yeah. uh, or, yeah. or, you know, homeowner's insurance. If you have, I've heard from people that if you keep a venomous snake in your house, a homeowner's insurance won't cover it if someone else gets bit or if it gets loose, mm-hmm. you know, there's all these other things that you have to consider. And, um, not that they're not amazing animals because they are, they're super, super cool. Uh, and I have a lot of respect for them. And I know Roy, you do too, just with what you do mm-hmm. with the relocation and education. Yeah. Um, it's just, again, it's just crazy. So, so that's yeah. that, that's the story kind of in depth. Um, again, I, you know, I hesitated to really talk about it a lot because I don't, I don't want to glorify it. I don't want people to get interested in keeping venomous just because it's right. a cool thing. Um, and it's not that it's not a cool thing. It is a really cool thing, but so is keeping, you know, box turtles and newts and yeah, you know, your mastics and spilotes and all that stuff. So mm-hmm. um, it's just not for everybody. And I think that they're, you know, I know you guys talked a little bit yesterday. Well, not yesterday, but the podcast you posted yesterday with, with Jay talking about, mm-hmm. um, you know, legislation and litigation and, and being, um, you know, self, a self-regulating body. I think there's a lot mm-hmm. to that. Um, and I, I haven't finished the podcast. It's a little difficult for me to do it all in one shot now with the kids, but, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if this was touched on, but it's sure. almost, um, you know, if someone's selling a $20 Cobra, then they should be responsible for who they sell it to. You know, there's gotta be a little oh, bit, sure. but you know, then I, but then that goes back to just the ethics of everybody selling reptiles. You know, when there's importers that have sure. tables full of animals that are dehydrated, starving, parasite mm-hmm. loads and they're just selling them because it's just a commodity to them. It's not a, a living thing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, there's obviously got to be a way to combat that or, or to make it better. And I just don't know what that is yet, but um, yeah. Anyway. So yeah. Yeah. Man. I don't want to derail story. myself too much. Yeah. No, I mean, they, they, I mean, first of all, just thanks for, thanks for sharing it. And I know there's some vulnerability too in sharing a story like that. You know, you, you mentioned like, you know, feeling some level of embarrassment and everything. And, um, so I appreciate you sharing it. And I mean, the, one of the first things that comes up for me is just like a curiosity about, like you said, you talked to some other people who've had bites. Um, I mean, for those who don't, who aren't aware, it's, it's somewhat, typically you wouldn't expect so, so much neurotoxic effect from a crotalid bite. I mean, although we are seeing it more and more, I'm curious if you spoke to anybody else who had it that had those neurotoxic effects, like the tingling, you know, and the spasms and all that stuff that you were describing. So <clears throat> there's a gentleman that got bit kind of in the Bay area by uh, a Northern Pacific rattlesnake. Mm-hmm. And he had definitely some tissue loss in his finger where he got bit. It's his fingers kind of permanently bent. Um, mm-hmm. But he had the same thing. He actually wasn't able to walk for quite a while after the bite. He was getting wheelchair. Wow. Uh, so there was some neurotoxic effect there, which for me, that was a little more surprising with that species, just because that species, yeah. at least from my, and I'm not a, collegiate toxicologist, mm-hmm. herpetologist by any stretch. But um, that was kind of news to me that that species, especially even that population had that kind of effect in the venom. Um, mm-hmm. As far as the neurotoxic stuff goes, uh, the toxicologist actually called me probably four or five months post bite and wanted to see how I was doing, but mm-hmm. also wanted to know if, if I was okay with them using my case in a paper that they were putting out. Um, right, well. Mainly because I knew exactly where the snake came from. I knew exactly yeah. the species of snake. Because very rarely does someone get a snake bite and have that kind of information. Right. right. Exactly. And so they were, what he was saying was that they were finding that more and more of the snake bites in Southern California are popping up as having more neurotoxic effects. And it's much easier to just study the, the people that get bit and the geography of where they got bit as opposed to going out and sampling a bunch of wild mm-hmm. snakes for venom. So that was kind of the point of that paper. And I, I was supposed to get the paper, but I, you know, I, mm-hmm. it's not happened. So, yeah. um, but there's that. So there definitely seems to be a shift for whatever reason that um, they're having more of a, a neurotoxic effect in the venom, at least with the SoCal Hellerai as opposed to, you know, years past or whatever. Yeah. That's, yeah. The other yeah, thing that, that really strikes me is just like the speed at which you were seeing symptoms, you know, to see them so quickly. I'm curious if the, toxicologist had anything at any insight about that. I mean, the immediate, the immediate thought that I have is like, I've heard 
from some folks. I mean, obviously, like typically venom spreads through the lymph system to the to plasma essentially, and it's a bit slower to spread for that reason. But if there is any direct contact with, from the fang into into a vein or an artery, it can move much more quickly. And it just makes me curious. Like, I wonder if this snake hit hit a little blood vessel in your finger or something like that, and you know, and that could have contributed to it. But I I just don't know. Yeah, yeah, they um. There was no talk of that. I mean, it, mm-hmm. it, my symptoms spreading and my talking about it, it apparently seemed normal to them or kind of on course. Um, mm-hmm. You know, being bit in the hand, your hands are pretty vascular. So that doesn't surprise me that all the cap, yeah. I mean, if it was just capillary action, there's, you know, yeah. all in your hand. So um, actually, I just remembered they, they came in to x-ray my hand because they, for some stupid reason, they wanted to x-ray my hand. I said, you're not going to mm-hmm. see anything on my hand with that x-ray. Oh no, but yeah. we want to. I'm like, you're not, you're not going to see anything. And they of mm-hmm. course didn't, um, but actually did pop a little tooth out of my hand about two weeks after the fight. So uh, oh, wow. yeah, the x-ray was just a, an extra cost I had to incur for no reason. But uh, yeah. anyway, but yeah, as far as that venom goes, yeah, it's, it's hard to say, um, mm-hmm. hard to say uh, if that was kind of a normal thing or, or just a unique scenario with me, you know? So yeah. It's weird. Yeah, man, like, it's so fascinating. It's weird. I, I feel like um I feel like the the embarrassment that you say you feel around this is is like not really warranted, you know. I mean people um I understand why people why we sort of like as a community, people in herpetoculture tend to have all these feelings around taking precautions and being safe, you know, around when you're working with venomous stuff, but like you know, like if someone goes and takes a fall when they're going mountain biking, no one's like, idiot, you know, <laughs> like you just couldn't get it together. And it's like, well, but it's this, it's the same kind of thing. You know, you're working with an inherent risk and you know, you're taking chances when you do things that you want to do for fun and enjoy it, mm-hmm. you know? So I feel like to me, it just doesn't seem like a warranted reaction for any, first of all, for anybody to give you a hard time about it as if they've never made a mistake in their life. And, you know, maybe for you, don't beat yourself up too much about it because everybody makes mistakes, you know, and it's not good. It happens to other people and it'll happen to other people in the future. And I don't know, at least maybe that's my perspective. Maybe I'm missing something there, but that's kind of how I feel about it. Like people do the same thing. It seems like the more extreme the behavior seems to get. Um the more people tend to like blame the result on the person. So like, you know, if somebody dies base jumping or free soloing, people are like, what did you expect, idiot? You know, <laughs> which is kind of unfair, you know, because it's really just like a, it's just like a sliding scale. It's like, oh, you mess around with venomous snakes. You play with fire, you're going to get burned. It's like, well, yeah, but you drive a car. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you're driving a car, man. Like you be in a car accident. Is that your fault? Play with fire, you're going to get burned. It just seems like, it's, I don't know, it's just weird. Maybe that's just me, but I, I really think this is weird. I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sweat it like that. Not like that. It doesn't mean you shouldn't learn from it, but you know. Right, right. And no, that's, and that's, that's the whole thing. I, you know, I've, I've seen people who almost wear their bite as a badge of honor, and that just really rubs me the wrong yeah. way. And that's, well, that's partly why, too. that's partly why I just have not really talked about it a lot. Not because, not because I'm trying to hide it, um, yeah. but because I don't want to. I don't want to give it popularity. I don't want to be, hey, that guy. People want to. Come, people want to talk to me, kind of thing. But also, yeah, sure. it's a learning thing. It's a be safe kind of thing. You know, I share it. I share it when it's appropriate. You know. Yeah. So, you know. Still. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I well, just, one thing I'm curious about too, just just is how has it changed your relationship to to rattlesnakes or do you have a different relationships to hellerai specifically has any of that changed for you yeah so obviously being being ambulatory like i could move around pretty easily and that i got mm-hmm. bit in march which is just kind of the very beginning of like prime herping season in my area yeah. yeah um you know it's like well i'm gonna be going out herping um and there's areas with rattlesnakes you know and yeah the yeah. first um the first outing i went on uh that year I think we found, th- well, I say we, it was me. I flipped three different individuals. And that first one that I flipped, you know, I was very cautious. You know, I, I know where they are in the areas where we, where we go look for snakes. I kind of, 
Right. I'm like, what's about me anyway? But it was very much like extra. So I was extra careful. Yeah. Like beyond beyond my normal standard, don't lift with your hands, you know, use use a hook or a, you know, whatever it is to lift boards kind of a thing. Just you're not sticking your fingers on a snake. But that first right. one I flipped, I definitely felt my heart flutter a little bit like, oh, that's a rattlesnake, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, it was a cool morning. None of them ever moved, but it definitely, um, there was no, I wouldn't say there was PTSD, but there definitely was a little bit of like a, a different, it was a different feeling finding yeah, yeah. a wild rattlesnake after the bite, you know. Um, yeah, I bet. Sure. So, but as far as anything else has gone or anything else goes, as it were, um, no, nothing else has really changed. Again, like I said, I've, I've definitely thought about, you know, anytime that I had had a venomous snake, it's like, all right, if I'm going to work, you know, work with it, i.e. like feed, you know, clean the enclosure, change the water bowl, whatever. Um, it was always, okay, let somebody know like, hey, I'm going to be doing this. So someone else knows. Usually it was Kimberly. Mm-hmm. And then in my snake room, making sure that everything was out of the way. Like I had as much free movement as possible you know, to be able to move around and get around. So I wasn't stumbling or tripping or, you know, my snake room can get kind of cluttered sometimes. So I always mm-hmm. had that in place, but even, even with those looking back, it's like, well, I mean, I really should have had this and I could have done this better and nothing happened, you know, at home ever, but it was, it was things where it's like, well, I really probably should have had this as opposed to that. And I probably should have done it this way as opposed to that way. So those mm-hmm. kind of things have changed. And I haven't gone back to it. I, I haven't kept anything, um, that that venomous or at least uh outwardly venomous since then so yeah makes sense that's wild super man. fascinating cool man yeah yeah it's really it's really fascinating and i appreciate you sharing it i mean it's just something i'm of course i'm curious about like you said just just having as much proximity to rattlesnakes as i do for much of the year it's like i've always been curious about yeah what it's like to be bitten you know i've, I've been fortunate that i've never I've never experienced it yet, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely, I have a higher likelihood of it than most of someday potentially experiencing that, um, despite my best protocols, you know, in place all the time. Um, it's just something I'm curious about. So I appreciate you sharing it. And yeah, well, um, now, now I'm even at a, you know, the, the toxicologist did say I'm, I'm potentially at a higher risk for going into anaphylaxis if it ever happens again. So I have to be like yeah. even extra, extra, extra careful because it could be its potential. I mean, and I never want it to happen again. I'll do everything I can oh, yeah. to not not let it happen again. But, you know, as as Phil kind of led on, you know, if you play with fire mm-hmm. and not, not that I'm playing with fire, but, you know, mm-hmm. um, it's, you know, stuff happens. But so that definitely was on my mind. So, you know, while I'm out herping, I've got an EpiPen with me just just because. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, there's just a, a, a more inherent risk now just because who knows how my body's going to react. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Man, I mean, that's so a, much. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, that's a wild story. I really appreciate you sharing all that stuff. Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead, it's, Roy, good th- it's, it's good. It's a good thing to hear, you know, on some level, just to like also just like the, the pieces you spoke to about just like what to do and what not to do, you know, like, there's so much, there's just so much misinformation about like what you should do if, you know, you get bit by a rattlesnake. It's like, you should suck the venom out. You should, you should, you know, cut a little X into it, <laughs> you know, and then suck the venom out. And it's like, um, I don't know, maybe at some point we should have like a, a, an episode with a, with a doc or something specifically talking about the do's and don'ts. Um, Cause I feel like it's a little bit more involved than the kind of time we have for in this moment. But the, but the long Enjoy story the short is, is don't do anything other than, call emergency services and get yourself to a hospital as quickly as possible. That's basically right. the, the long and short of it. Remove well, I, tight I, fitting I, clothing or jewelry if you have it on. <laughs> right. I, 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 I should follow up with every case is going to be different. Everybody reacts exactly. differently. So just because I had a full on neuro response doesn't mean that you could be bit by the exact same snake and not have a crazy yeah, hematoxic response where you lose your finger and who knows, right? So, mm-hmm. um, and like you just said, yeah, Call 911. Just just let someone yeah. else deal with it. Um, you know, oftentimes as growing up, it was like, you know, if you get bit, keep your heart rate down, elevate. I know it was mm-hmm. uh, it was keep keep the bite below your heart, you know. Mm-hmm. None of none of that would have mattered with my bite. Yeah. With how with how fast everything happened, it I mean, 
maybe it would have been a minute faster, but not, nothing was going to change how fast that venom reacted. So, yeah. And again, that's me. So mm-hmm. maybe for somebody else, it would have been an hour or two hours, or maybe it would have been a shorter time. Who knows? But, um, you know, like, like you said, yeah. And like I did, just call 911, be very clear. Uh, that was the big thing was to be calm and to be clear. Like, this is not a joke. This is very serious. This happened, yeah. you know, um, and just, just get the help you need if you, if you have to get help. So for sure. Yeah. Well, should we, should we pivot and talk a little bit about the super show? Hype it a little bit before we call it yeah. in the morning. Yeah. Let's, let's yeah. talk about something fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's, let's talk about something fun. I mean, fun. admittedly, that was very fun. If you ask me. <laughs> well, and so that's why I say that, you know, I'm not proud of it. I'm embarrassed. It was a terrible experience. And it was fascinating. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. I think I would orient very similarly if I got bitten. I would immediately, oh, yeah. I mean, of course, I would be freaked out and all stuff, but I would also be incredibly curious. I'd be like, all right, I got to get my notebook out. <laughs> yeah. 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 For do, sure. uh, do, do either of you guys watch Jackass or have watched Jackass? Uh, uh, no. Not for a, a decade or more. Well, that is familiar. That's a, that's a bummer because it's hilarious. But anyway, so uh, you know the guy Johnny Knoxville is kind of like the head head jackass guy. He actually was uh-huh. was talking. He wanted to like for a bit. He wanted to take a bite from a rattlesnake just to get bit, and then immediately go and get antivenin. And everyone's like, "No, you can't. You no, cannot. Because uh, no. you know, because you don't know. Like I said, you know. Yeah, you don't know. My reaction gonna, isn't yeah. going to be your reaction, and so that was. They he he just like no I just want to know what it feels like I'm like yeah but you could die yeah mm-hmm. so anyway add that yeah but you know yeah. add that to the short list of things or the long list of things they've done where they could also die yeah that's true you know that's true yeah well yeah. what do you got cooking for the super show Chris what do you what are you planning on what do I have cooking well I actually st- yeah. I still have house snake eggs cooking um, oh nice. Ooh. I'm going to, I'm going to get Phil house snakes. I'm going to talk him back. Into it. <laughs> that, that was what he failed with. And I'm going to make it happen. I'm, he's going to have to go. Hey, home there home. we go. All right. Bring it. Um, uh, we'll, yeah, trade, so, Euro, we'll trade for euros. Like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, then I'll keep my house snakes. Uh, anyway. Um, so I've got, a, I've got a couple barons I'm going to be bringing. Uh, I've got a lot of king snakes, a lot of corn snakes. Some milk snakes, Hondurans and Sinaloans, uh, some ball pythons. Uh, so kind of like the standard babies that I normally have. In addition, as I kind of mentioned earlier, the very beginning, you know, with my time being limited, I am going to be moving out of some projects. So I've got some projects that are maybe I've, I've been raising something for a year or two years, three years kind of a thing. So I've got some things that are like ready to breed right now that would breed this next year. But I'm going to be bringing some of that stuff too. Um, it's all colubrid stuff. Um, apart from a handful of, I've got an, a big albino bow I'm going to bring because I just don't have anything to pair her with. And mm-hmm. As much as I like that snake, I just, I kind of have to trim the fat, unfortunately. So got to find her a good home. But um, so again, kind of the standard colubrid fair with some pythons and then uh, some of the projects I've been raising up. So some kind of neat stuff. And I am very, very motivated to not bring stuff back home. So, you know, mm-hmm. take that as you will. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be there to wheel and deal. I want people to be happy. Like I said, I want people to get their first snake. Um, I love selling the kid their first snake. That's like the coolest thing ever. And, oh, yeah. uh, and so I'm all about that. But, uh, you know, if, it's a, if you're a person that wants to get snakes or you're a business or you're just a person that wants to buy a bunch of snakes, you know, I'm very open to wholesale kind of stuff. Um, but, but mainly I'm looking to have a good time with you guys. So that's going to be the big thing. Yeah, yeah, man, we're going to have fun. I think the the tagline is an irresponsible amount of fun. That yeah. that that was what was quoted. So we'll see if it happens. <laughs> Highly yeah. important. Absolutely. Yeah. High level of cool, importance. Man. I know. I know. You got on the table. I know. Phil's bringing euros. Yep. Anything else? I don't think so. Just euros. Um. I have some other stuff that I could potentially move, but like, I mean, I kind of want to sit on everything for a while, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I have some big goals for the next couple of years, maybe two, three years. Very, very substantial goals that take a lot of work on my part. 
And I, mm-hmm. I have had the habit in the past of just kind of like, you know, just moving on from stuff too quickly or, um, like selling animals that I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't really need to. Um, uh, and so I'm trying to kind of take a different approach this go around and see if I can do a little bit better over these next few years and meet some of those goals. So just euros this time, but nice. really, really damn nice ones for what it's worth. Uh, well, sure. I, I, I will say this being a, a regular visitor to the show, to that particular show and, and most shows in California, as it were, um, really not. I, as far as captive bread, I, I don't think I've ever seen captive bread euros. Well, no, that's not true. I have, it's been a long time. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, recently, there were some ornate and Egyptian imports that came in. They actually looked relatively yeah. good for imports, but um, yeah, yeah. But there's just not euros, so you'll definitely be the uh, the the king of the castle there with with captive bread ornates, and uh, so it should be pretty nice. Well, thanks, man. I mean, I think I'm sure that a bunch of those imports will be around, but those don't really compare to what what I'm offering, and. Uh, you know, it's all right. I'm sure there'll be some other people and that's okay. You know, I, uh, I, I don't feel competitive with anybody or anything like that. It's not really what motivates me or, um, I could be one of 50 people there with euros and I'm still good. I'm still good with it, you know? So, uh, that's okay. But I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, absolutely. And then Roy's bring in his, his puffers. Yep. Yeah, I'll bring a handful of those. Um, Did again, you decide if uh, you're going to bring any of your annuls? I I might be bring one. I don't have a bunch that I can really part with right now, but I could I could probably part with like one male, um, one of the ones I've hatched to capture bread. But I might bring him just just to see. I mean those those are awesome. Talk about like a a cool species that you know that just doesn't get enough appreciation, especially, you know, you're not going to find it on captive bread and, um, and the captive bread are just so fun to work with. So it'd be cool to show those off a little bit, but the main priority will definitely be bringing this below And I'm still kind of toying with the idea of, of being, of bringing my big mail. Um, because I think that it's just, it's just a different thing to get to see an adult sulfurious, um, especially one that's tractable and, and, um, yeah, he just turned 16. It was his birthday this month. So he is still shredding and, um, cool to celebrate handsome boy's birthday with the super show appearance. Oh. Um, he's actually been to those shows before, but it's yeah. been, uh, yeah. five years or something. And it was not with me. It was with, uh, with John. Who uh, is, yeah. That was, was actually my, my, my first well, experience yeah. with that species was was your male without yeah. realizing it. So that was pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, that's so cool. We'll throw, I love that, man. We'll throw him a quinceanera. <laughs> yeah, dude. That's I mean, we got I mean, that would have been last well, he's year. A little, but, uh, he, he's a yeah, it would have been 15, <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> we'll we'll throw him a party though, you know? I mean, we gotta do something for him. I was actually thinking I might make some handsome boys sweet sixteen shirts, some limited edition shirts for people. So uh I think it's gotta happen because that, that's a He's a, he's an iconic snake. You gotta, gotta, gotta celebrate him while he's still here and, uh, and, and being strong he still is. So, and, and if you uh, want to see an 11 foot Amazon puffing snake, um, come by the table and show out. Cause I think I'm going to bring him. And we're going to have, uh, a whole mess of, uh, project herpetoculture stickers and shirts and hoodies and mugs and cool stuff. Yep. Yep. We will. We'll have, we got a whole, whole run of stuff that we're going to have there. Hopefully it'll all just disappear while we're there. So we don't have to lug it back. So did you yeah, guys decide if we're going to do any kind of interview stuff at all while you're down there? I think it might be a bit challenging to do it at the show. Um, just audio stuff and all of that. And just how hectic it'll, I imagine it'll be, but I am going to bring some um, audio equipment. And if there's, if it looks like there's an opportune moment to do it, we'll, we'll take it. Um, I was also thinking about just doing some stuff with the phone and maybe like mm-hmm. stitching together a video with just like asking people questions at the show. And um, we're definitely, we're definitely going to do something. And then maybe we'll have our, our nicer equipment for 
maybe a recording with somebody in the hotel or something one night um, that we're down there. We'll see how it goes, but um, there's definitely going to be some sort of bonus content related to the super show, but how exactly it looks. Yeah. You got to kind of figure it out. Cause part of the thing is like having never done that before, been there before, it's just like, it's all going to be a new learning curve. And I know that this show is going to be just nuts for us. Um, especially for me, given that I just live out in the middle of nowhere on a mountain and, uh, I rarely see there's, I think that like the attendance of this show is like more than 25 times the population of the town nearest me. So it's going to be overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. Pe- people come from all over. I know people will come from Nevada and Arizona, yeah. like just, just to come to the show. Um, and in fact, I think there's vendors that well, vendors obviously come from all over for that show. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I want to say that they've quoted like ten thousand plus attendees for the weekend. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's going to be awesome. It'll be great. Cool. Well, is there anything else we want to plug before we call it a morning? I know we've almost we're almost at two hours of of your time here, borrowing you from your family on a Saturday morning. Yeah, um, no, I'm just uh, I'm good, man. I'm excited to chat with you guys again. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, as, as fun as the conversation has been, I feel like we could have gone a whole bunch of different directions with her pediculture in general. And we just kind of focused on me oh, and yeah. my one, my one dumb accident. That's so, always the case. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely stuff I want to talk about. I talked, Roy, we talked a little bit. Um, yeah. At the sack show of a few things that I really wanted yeah, to yeah. throw up, but we don't have time for that today. Not now. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just do it again. I mean, maybe we'll record so. an episode at, uh, maybe we'll be the, We'll just record the, with the crew, the show crew. Oh, there you go. For the sack show or for the um, super show episode. We'll see. But either way, I know I want to I want to talk about that stuff too and have more kind of like in-depth, a little bit more her philosophy conversation. It feels like we're due for that. My phone's bugging out on me. Sorry, guys. That's okay. Oh, you, you seem fine. You, you look good. Apart from your grimace, don't grimace. Yeah, he's... Uh, look, at him. look at that grimace. Anyway, yeah, I, w- anyway. I will say I will say this since since our our episode re recorded and then obviously listening to all the phenomenal guests you've had on because you've had some just I haven't I haven't really listened to any that I really didn't care for at least at mm-hmm. least in some aspect but um, mm-hmm. it's uh, that's again and that's you know I mentioned the family being why I'm kind of retooling my collection but you know even prior to that it was taking a step back and like how can I do this to the best of my ability? And I can't, you know, I can do better. So let's do better. And Mm -hmm. um, so I want to give, again, that's just another facet of why I'm kind of slimming things down to focus on, on, on things. So I can do more, do more with less and do it better. So yeah, it's because of you guys, because of what you guys are doing. So thanks for that, man. Yeah. Thanks dude. Appreciate hearing that. Yeah, man. I'm excited to get some, quality time all hanging together too yeah same that's gonna be good talking it's gonna be good fun i kind of cut you off there phil what were you gonna say before no no i was just i was just gonna echo what you just said it wasn't anything in particular i'm just Mm -hmm. out here taking taking a walk while i podcast it was great i like it yeah (laughs) all right well should we call it a call it a morning and resume our our saturday activities it's been great guys yeah well, thanks, Chris. We'll have you back soon, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. It's kind of crazy; it's that soon already. But yeah, wow. we are we're we're two weeks away. It's yeah. crazy. It'd be awesome. Well, I guess one last little plug: people can find you at Sharpshooter Reptiles on Instagram. Instagram, Facebook. Instagram seems to be the the easiest place to find me and like okay. see what I'm doing. Uh, I do have the Facebook page, and I do have a TikTok, but I I don't know how that freaking works i don't understand tiktok I, you know You're braver just, than us man we haven't you know, braved tiktok it's, yet apparently it's the way to go with social media yeah. and i just i don't know man it's fun to put music to videos i take but that's about all i've got so yeah yeah but, i hear yep. you yep that's it all right well that's where you can find the people and um thanks again chris we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks i'm gonna hit the button thanks man